Good evening. SWR. For many hams, it stands like a predator waiting to pounce on their transmitter and quickly dispatch it. But what is it really? Today we are going to explore this most misunderstood three-letter beast. Our story begins in the early 20th century with a group of enthusiasts who dreamed of talking with others via the new magical medium of radio. In many cases, they were self-trained using whatever parts they could find in attics and on farms. Their antennas were made of wires and their feed lines were two parallel wires with wooden spaces to keep them apart. These were called open wire feeders. Between the output of the transmitter and the feed line, an antenna tuner was often used. While transmitting, some of these early hams put a light bulb across the two wires of the feed line. By running the lamp along the feed line, they found that the brightness varied rhythmically between a maximum and a minimum. As these points did not move while transmitting, they were termed standing waves. They reasoned that the maximum and minimum brightness corresponded with maximum and minimum voltages on the feed line. Soon a formula was produced expressing the ratio of these two voltages. This ratio became known as the Voltage Standing Wave Ratio, or VSWR, which was later shortened to SWR. The formula is VSWR equals maximum voltage divided by minimum voltage. So if the maximum voltage was 10 volts and the minimum was 5 volts, this would yield 10 divided by 5, giving a VSWR of 2. So you can see that the greater the difference between the maximum and minimum voltages, the higher was the SWR. Some of these enthusiasts, now called amateur radio operators or simply hams, noticed that by varying the length of their antenna wires and where they placed the feed line along it, these standing waves could be eliminated. In this case, the brightness of the lamp was the same over the entire length of the feed line, and the VSWR was 1. Strangely, the operators noticed that this did not seem to make much difference to the strength of their signal at remote locations, whether standing waves were present or not. We will see that this was due to the very low loss of the open wire feeders used in that day. After World War II, large quantities of surplus coaxial cable became available at reasonable prices, opening up this new feed line medium to average hams. Soon the open wire lines were discarded for the easier to use coaxial cable. The advent of inexpensive SWR meters soon followed, and thus began the race for the elusive SWR ratio of 1. But exactly why is SWR important? First, we should take note that feed lines have a parameter called characteristic impedance. This is a value in ohms which is dependent on the physical construction of the feed line. For example, a typical open wire line will have a characteristic impedance of 450 ohms, or if more widely spaced wires are used, it may be around 600 ohms. Similarly, coaxial cables typically have characteristic impedances of 50 or 75 ohms. This is a characteristic of the conductor diameters, their spacing and the type of material used between them. It is important to note that this is not a DC resistance but rather a property which a travelling radio wave will experience. Now, let's set up a typical ham station and see how the flow of energy proceeds from transmitter to the antenna. In the first case, let's assume the antenna has been replaced by a resistor. The value of the resistor is set to the same value as the characteristic impedance of the feed line. Let's make the resistor 50 ohms and use a coaxial cable with a characteristic impedance of 50 ohms as well. We also assume the transmitter has been designed to pump its energy efficiently into a 50 ohm load. First, the transmitter sends the radio frequency energy into the feed line, which trans transports it to the antenna. In the feed line, an amount of energy is lost, the exact value depending on the construction of the feed line. At the end of the feed line, the radio frequency energy which is not lost in the feed line is totally absorbed by the 50 ohm resistor. This causes the resistor to heat up and emit heat energy into space. If we replace the resistor by an antenna, which totally emits its energy in the form of radio waves, it will look just like a 50 ohm resistor to the transmitter and feed line. This means the antenna has a radiation resistance of 50 ohms. However, what if the antenna does not have a radiation resistance of 50 ohms? In this case, where the antenna radiation resistance does not match the characteristic impedance of the feed line, some of the energy will not be emitted into space. This energy will be reflected from the antenna back along the feed line towards the transmitter. On its way back, it will combine both destructively and constructively with the forward flowing RF energy and build up a standing wave. If there is a large amount of reflected energy, the peaks and troughs will be separated by a large amount. 
giving a high maximum and low minimum voltage standing wave on the feed line. This translates into a high SWR ratio. The effect at the transmitter end is to vary the impedance that the transmitter sees from 50 ohms to some other value. This results in the final amplifier transistors not operating in their most efficient state, drawing more current, possibly overheating and ultimately destroying them. This is why many modern transceivers have SWR monitoring and protection circuits to reduce the power output in the face of high SWR values. So what is the solution? One method commonly used is to insert an antenna tuner after the transmitter. This tuner will intercept the reflected wave, adjust its phase so that it combines with the forward wave and send it back to the antenna. The transmitter will see its preferred 50 ohm load and will deliver maximum output to the input of the antenna tuner. Of course, some of this forward energy will be absorbed in the feed line again and some will be reflected back again, but ultimately most of the energy will be emitted by the antenna. This is why open wire lines can be operated with quite high SWR values. On each transit of the feed line, an open wire line only absorbs a tiny amount of energy, so multiple transits still leave a lot of energy to emit from the antenna. A coaxial cable, however, generally has a higher loss than open wire feeder, so each transit of the feed line, due to reflections, absorbs more and more energy until there is little left to emit from the antenna. A higher SWR means higher amounts of reflected energy to be absorbed. So in the case of coaxial cables, it is desirable to operate the feed line with a low SWR value to minimise losses. An antenna tuner should also be used to match the complex impedance of the high SWR feed line to the 50 ohms required by most modern transceivers. If practical, an antenna tuner at the antenna itself would be an efficient solution as it would ensure a low SWR on the feed line and be able to match the antenna impedance. What about SWR meters? Well, the invention of inexpensive SWR meters allowed us hams to monitor SWR at will. The result of this is a strong culture of striving for a low SWR at all costs. But can this be trusted? Consider the operation of many SWR meters. They are generally placed in line with the coaxial cable, such that they monitor the current in the line. A pickup system is designed to measure the voltages induced by the forward and the reflected waves. The SWR is then calculated by using the following formula. SWR equals the forward voltage plus the reverse voltage divided by the forward voltage minus the reverse voltage. So, as an example, if the forward wave voltage was 10 volts and the reverse wave voltage was 5 volts, the SWR would be 15 divided by 5, giving, giving an answer of 3. If you examine the formula, you can see it is non-linear. That is, it does not give a straight line when plotted on a graph. This is why the SWR meter scales are cramped at the high SWR values. Also, most simple SWR meters are really nothing more than two volt meters, showing the forward and the reflected voltages. When you move the potentiometer control to set the forward voltage to the set point, the reflected voltage display will be showing the voltage of the reflected wave relative to the full scale reading of the forward voltage, thus giving an indication of SWR. But this SWR reading can be deceptive. Consider if you have an antenna feed line combination which reflects back a lot of energy. If you have a very lossy coaxial cable, both the forward and the reflected wave would be severely attenuated. As most SWR meters are placed near the transmitter, the lossy cable may absorb a lot of this reflected energy. Consequently, when it gets to the SWR meter, it may not give much of a voltage at all. The SWR would be seen as very good, but in fact your system would be delivering very little power to the antenna and the feed line would be absorbing most of the energy. So a very lossy coaxial feed line may make your system look as if it's working very well, when in fact the opposite is true. This is why SWR should not be used as a sole determinant of your antenna system's health. The feed line is vitally important, as is the understanding of the concept that reflected energy is not lost, but is actually sent back to the antenna by the tuner where a portion is emitted, and some reflected again to begin the cycle anew. Well, that brings us to the end of this presentation. Thank you for viewing and I wish you a good night.